in his PhD at the University of Texas Austin. And he will, he's also the CTO of Aptronic, and he will present today in their book. Just give us a second to set it up. Great, can you all hear me okay? Can you all hear me okay? Oh yeah, is that you, Nick? <laughs> yes. Awesome, perfect, yes we can. Great, <clears throat> it's great to be speaking with you guys here today. Um, I want to get started with a little bit of background about the company. Uh, we're based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, we're about six years old, uh, up to about 50 employees now. And our roots go back to the Dark Robotics Challenge. Um, the early years of the company were largely funded through projects and, and revenue. So uh, due to that, we had a lot of flexibility and time to really kind of mature our technology and choose the projects we wanted to work on. Uh, we had the opportunity to work with several Fortune 100 companies. We worked on several large government projects, uh, all kind of aligned along the theme of building robots for the unstructured world. And that's what I'm going to talk about here today, uh, talking both about some historical systems that we worked on, in addition to some uh, future work that we're uh, taking on. So um, there's a number of different robots in this presentation, but they're all kind of aligned towards this unifying goal of building general purpose robots to do meaningful work out in the real world. Uh, I think this concept of robots as tools for labor or manual labor is a really powerful one. And it certainly resonates with customers when they go out and talk about how to address the labor shortage issues that are uh, persistent. Uh, the, the scale of, of application for these systems is really you know, almost unbounded. Um, certainly, there's uh, steep technical, technological challenges to solve for us to be able to fully realize this vision. Uh, for example, you know, bipedal locomotion in unstructured terrains is not by any means a solved problem. Uh, in addition to that, our, our perspective is that uh, manipulation is also really important. I know this is a like a robotics uh, workshop, but um, it's useful to be able to ma manipulate the world to do useful tasks out in the real world. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the hardware integration design is all really uh, a key aspect of this as well. And that's one of the, the parts I'll be focusing on a bit more uh, in this talk. So um, splitting the talk into kind of two parts here. The first part is really going to focus on some of our historical work, uh, building robots for unstructured applications. And some of these are not going to be legged applications, but uh, I think the problems that we're solving still apply to this audience. Uh, these are, are roughly grouped based on actuation approach. Um, and I'll be going kind of over some of the rationale there. Uh, on the second part, I'll talk a little bit about our current state in, in humanoid robotics. So starting off with Astro, this is a, a dexterous manipulation robot that was really designed to try to approach the levels of, of uh, manipulation and dexterity that, that we have as humans. Uh, this applies to the form factor, the kinematics, uh, the payloads and uh, kind of the geometry of the system. And the system is actuated using series elastic actuation, which is a pretty unique uh, actuation approach, which gives these very low impedance uh, rendering capability. Uh, as you can see on the right, this is a pretty useful actuation uh, architecture for any kind of human robot interaction tasks. Uh, and you can, you can also have the ability to stiffen up gains to be fairly precise for you know, more precision. Uh, manipulation tasks. Apex is an agile load-bearing exoskeleton that we designed as part of the TALIS program with the US government. Uh, this was intended for able body operators operating in uh, mission critical uh, scenarios. And like the prior system uh, that I just talked about, uh, this robot is also very tightly coupled to humans. And so human-robot interaction is really important to uh, consider from a design standpoint. Um, there's a number of different actuators in this system, but uh, there's a, a majority of them which are series elastic, uh, which is really key for this uh, kind of high fidelity force control and low imp impedance interaction. So series elastic actuation as a, uh, an architecture has some strengths and weaknesses, just as any other actuation approach does. Uh, high fidelity force control is possible as is low impedance rendering. Uh, 
we can get pretty high torque to mass ratios and torque to volume due to the ability to use fairly large gear ratios. Uh, weaknesses are additional sensors and, and springs that need to be added into actuators. Uh, and there is a, a mechanical low pass filter. So this makes high impedance rendering or uh, kind of high bandwidth position tracking a, a bit challenging. Uh, example applications are, are human robot interaction uh, scenarios as, as we've touched on here. Uh, moving on, this is a Scorpio. This is a pretty unique robotic manipulator. Uh, that uses parallel elastic actuation. Uh, this is a, a unique architecture that uh, gives the system some unique capabilities. Uh, you can see on the top right, this is a metric of payload per weight. Uh, all these gray uh, lines here are conventional robotic manipulators that uh, use kind of a conventional gear motor actuation approach. Typically, it's really hard to approach one-to-one -one payload to mass ratios, uh, but you can achieve almost an order of magnitude improvement beyond that uh, using a parallel elastic actuation approach. You can also see kind of the standard uh, force control capabilities uh, shown on the video here to the left. Um, and I think one of the key things about this is just mechanical gravity compensation is a pretty uh, unique uh, capability. So another parallel elastic actuated robot that was built, uh, this is the, the Trinity robot. Um, See on the, on the left here, this is curling uh, 70 pounds at a pretty large moment arm. Uh, this robot really excels at com combining both high torque and high speed maneuvers, which is pretty difficult to achieve with conventional actuation approaches. Uh, typically, if you want high torque, you need to use large gear ratios, which uh, in turn limits your speed. Um, so this is a pretty unique actuation architecture. I think it has a lot of uh, promising features to it. Uh, including uh, extremely high torque per mass. Um, you also have extremely good energy efficiency. Uh, basically all the gravitational loads can be taken by uh, mechanical springs. Um, and as opposed to series elastic, uh, parallel elastic has a, the ability to render a very wide range of impedances. Um, weaknesses are complexity. So you may have multiple actuators per degree of freedom if you have maybe a separate inertial and gravitational actuator. Uh, and there's some specialized application kinematic considerations uh, and certainly awareness of the base frame orientation that can affect some of the mechanical uh, spring compensation. We found this to be pretty uh, useful in mobile manipulation applications where uh, the low weight and energy efficiency are kind of key uh, important metrics to optimize for. Uh, and then moving on to quasi direct drive, I think this is a, an architecture that many people here are probably familiar with. Um, but this is used in a upper body torso in this, in this video here. This is a, a test bed that we built, really is kind of a quick uh, controls test bed for you know, developing algorithms and showing that we can pick up rolls of tape with the teleop. And then of course, uh, quasi direct drives have found a lot of um, use in legged applications. Uh, this is a six degree of freedom biped that we built as a, uh, again, another controls test bed. Uh, and I'll talk more about this just in a moment. Uh, but summarizing quasi direct drive kind of pros and cons. Uh, strengths are simplicity and robustness. There's you know, kind of few moving, moving parts in this, few bearings. Um, speed and acceleration are also typically uh, pretty strong on quasi direct drives due to limited gear ratios. Um, and there's even some off the shelf options available for, um, which is pretty helpful for rapid prototyping and kind of quick iteration. Um, they struggle a little bit with torque density and specific torque. So um, it's not great to use these everywhere, but on certain joints on, on leg actuators and, and limbs, they can be pretty, uh, pretty effective. So over the years, we've built uh, probably upwards of 30 different actuators. This table is just a summary of a few of them that we've built over time. Uh, there's a, a pretty wide range of different architectures here. There's liquid cooled, air cooled, uh, there's series elastic, parallel elastic. Um, and so if you look at the data from all these different actuators, you can really start to identify trends and understand strengths and weaknesses of different approaches. Um, and this is really helpful when you're trying to go and intentionally design a system with the desired 
characteristics and dynamics that you want for uh, uh, your, your target application. So moving on to kind of more recent updates on what we've been doing in humanoids recently. Um, so we started off uh, a while ago kind of exploring some locomotion controllers. Uh, we wanted to uh, build a system that was about as simple as we could make it. Uh, this is a six degree of freedom point foot biped, which is actually you know, intentionally very difficult to control. Um, but this is the, the starting point that we, we begin with of kind of demonstrating uh, basic locomotion capabilities of moving around, turning, and also uh, trying to handle some disturbance rejection. And then mapping that into hardware. Uh, this shows some of the same uh, capabilities of balancing, uh, driving the system around with the uh, joystick commands, and then you know, trying to test some of the robustness of the control and the hardware, both in um, kind of shoving and blind terrain, uh, or blind locomotion and unstructured terrain. <laughs> And again, just to mention, you know, this is a tough system to control. So I think, um, you know, again, we're using uh, MPC-based control techniques here and, and uh, had a lot of success uh, with this approach. So our controller um, generalizes really well to a wide range of other systems. Um, shown here are just a, a sampling of a few different robots that we've designed coupled with a number that are you know, just out on the internet, you can, you can download and play with. Um, but we're really kind of happy that uh, for each of these systems, it's about less than a day of uh, dev time to get these up and running. So moving on to kind of a full scale humanoid setup. Um, these are just kind of some basic control behaviors uh, on the left, uh, pretty aggressive sagittal gait, uh, and then some some high speed, pretty dynamic uh, yaw motions. And on the right, kind of starting to think about some uh, basic grasping behaviors, both from table height and also from boxes that may be located down the ground. Just a few more videos here of, of uh, additional kind of compounded uh, behaviors. Um, the interface is pretty straightforward. You, you can drive this around just with a Xbox controller. And this was uh, us driving this through a, an obstacle course here on the left. And on the right, just starting to do some uh, basic primitive, useful tasks of uh, gross manipulation in a simple simulation environment. Of course, once you get these base functionalities uh, progressing, you can also uh, kind of add it, increased layers of abstraction. Uh, so it's pretty easy to add you know, waypoints and have you know, more high-level commands of deliver this box to this location. Um, so some added autonomy capability there as well. So this is what we're currently working on. Um, this is a, a full-scale five foot eight um, humanoid robot. Um, it is roughly anthropomorphic, so you know, we can use things like chairs effectively and enter into vehicles. Uh, which is a challenging control problem. Um, but this is designed for uh, pretty dynamic and agile locomotion over a wide range of, of terrains uh, and uh, just starting to get up to speed with some uh, basic manipulation tasks. This is the first of several iterations of the system at the time. Um, and I'm also excited to announce that we've raised 17 million recently towards commercialization of, of this effort. And again, a few more just simple early results and simulation of, of getting the system online. Uh, we can expect probably some results in hardware here before the end of the year. I'm also excited to announce that we've set up a long-term partnership with NASA uh, and their humanoid division. Uh, there's some folks that uh, are out of J NASA Johnson Space Center who did a lot of work on Valkyrie and uh, are particularly interested in fielding uh, general purpose robots and terrestrial applications as a stepping stone towards uh, spacefaring applications after that. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, we are hiring. So if you have any questions or want to learn more, feel free to reach out. Questions? Oh, um.
I have a question about the actuator. I, I know you guys like try so many different versions, but the, the latest if you want to, you guys uh, can tell us which actuator you guys choose. <laughs> Um, I won't go into a whole lot of detail on this design. Uh, there's a few trade secrets in here, but um, we can probably get more detail over time. That's a little bit of a disappointing answer. Uh, I have a question, Nick. Um, why isn't this humanoid um, working now? Like, what are the challenges that you're facing to go from simulation to the, the real platform? Um, we're just in the kind of the standard development pipeline now. Um, so um, this is kind of exiting design phase and we'll be kind of receiving hardware here in the next few months. Uh, so there's no kind of inherent limitations from a physical standpoint. What are you gonna be doing with NASA again? Um, so NASA is interested ultimately in, in uh, space applications. So um, you can see situations where robots that are sized and shaped like humans can be very helpful in uh, you know, setting up habitats on other, other planets uh, kind of many years down the road. Um, but in order to get there, it's important to prove viability uh, here on Earth. NASA is not, not going to field something that is a, a very high risk and, and um, underdeveloped technology. Uh, so NASA is, is really interested in uh, seeing these systems become viable here on Earth before uh, they're going to be able to field these systems out of off, off planet. Okay, um, thanks again, um, Nick. Um, I think Gerardo's around. Nick is unfortunately not around, but uh, Gerardo, stand up. Uh, Gerardo is here. If you guys want to, to talk with him afterwards, uh, please feel free. Thanks again, Nick. Uh, I can just figure out. Thank you.